In this video, we're going to take a look at the fifth race conditions lab on Port Swigger's Web Security Academy. The lab is called Partial Construction Race Conditions. So before we jump into the practical lab, let's read through the background information. It says that many applications create objects in multiple steps, which may introduce a temporary middle state in which the object is exploitable. For example, when registering a new user, an application may create the user in the database and then set the API key using two separate SQL statements. This leaves a tiny window in which the user exists, but the API key is uninitialized. This kind of behavior paves the way for exploits whereby you inject an input value that returns something matching the uninitialized database value, such as an empty string or null in JSON, and this is compared as part of the security control. Frameworks often let you pass in arrays and other non-string data structures using non-standard syntax. For example, in PHP, you can send an array like this. So you've got param square brackets equals foo, and param is the name of the array, as you can see here, and foo is the value which has been inserted into the array. Similarly, you could send two get parameters. The first one is param equals foo. The second one is param equals bar, and that will insert both of those values into an array. Or you can just send off the square brackets on its own beside the variable name, and that will create an empty array. Ruby on Rails lets you do something similar by providing a query or post parameter with a key but no value. In other words, param with key in square brackets results in the following server side object. In the example above, this means that during a race window, you could potentially make an authenticated API request as follows. And here we have a request which is sending an API key with an empty array. And because the API key hasn't yet been initialized, that would actually return true. Note, it's possible to cause similar partial construction collisions with a password rather than API key. However, as passwords are hashed, this means you need to inject a value that makes the hash digest match the uninitialized value. Okay, with the theory out of the way, let's take a look at the lab. The description says, this lab contains a user registration mechanism. A race condition enables you to bypass email verification and register an arbitrary email address that you do not own. To solve the lab, exploit this race condition to create an account and then log in and delete the user Carlos. We're told that we need to use the correct version of Burp again, but we should know that by now. So let's just go ahead and open the lab. So we've got an email client. We can open that up as well. And that has our email address that we'll be able to use for the lab. We've got our home, my account and register. Let's go straight to the register page. And this is the predict phase. So we want to try and work out where the potential collision might be. And then we'll probe it and then prove. And that's part of the methodology that we want to try and build up. So I'm going to put in a username. I'll put in cat. And let me try and put in the email address that we've been given, which is the wiener one, even though we don't have a wiener user. And then I'll just put in a password cat as well. We'll try and register. And it says invalid email address. So we have to use the at gin and juice shop email address. So I'll do that again. This time we'll do cat at gin and juice shop. And then we'll put in the same values. And it says, please check your emails for an account registration link. now. Obviously I can't do that because I don't have access to that email address. So either we need to try and find a way where we can actually insert this email address, or we need to try and find a way to compromise the email address belonging to ginandjuice.shop, or we can use a race condition to see if we can actually claim the account using that email address that we don't own. So the next thing I'll do is go over to Burp Suite and I'm gonna take a copy of that request that we just made, the register one, send it to the repeater so we can play around with this. And if I click send again, I just want to see what response we get. And it actually says an account already exists with that username. So every time we do something here, we're going to need to use a different username in order to test it properly. And since we have no way of getting this 2FA code, let's go back to the site. Let me open up the dev tools. And the first thing we probably want to do is just start enumerating the website, see is there anything interesting. There isn't any JavaScript here. But let's go back to the lab home and see if that's also the case. It is. Let's go to my account. That's the same. Register. And notice that we get to register then. We actually have a resources folder, which has static, and then users.js, which has some JavaScript code that we can go and analyze. And we have our registration form. We already know that because we've filled it in already. And that is the post request. But we've also got a confirm email function down here, which is going to grab a token from our URL. And so we need a get parameter called token. And then it's going to send that to slash confirm as a post request along with our token. So we could just have a go at that. Now what I'll actually do is just do this here. Let me do 
confirm, and then we'll do token is equal to, I'll just put in here any value, and it takes us to a confirm page. So we can confirm our token. I'm going to click confirm as well. And it says incorrect token. All right, I just wanted to step through that process so that we have all of the requests that we might be interested in in Burp. So it's this post request that I'm interested in. I'm going to send that through to the repeater and then we can just go and play around with this. And we basically want to do what we saw on the lab notes. So why don't we try and change this token and say that it's actually an array. And we get this other message back saying incorrect token array. Okay, so we can play around with this. Let's try and change that to zero because maybe an uninitialized value. And we get the same. Okay, what about just uninitialized array? And this time we get incorrect token array. Let's try and go back. Can we just set this to empty? We get a forbidden here, 403 forbidden with an empty token, but no array. Let's set that to zero. And now we get incorrect token. So just by playing around with this, we've got three possible outputs. One is incorrect token. If we change that to be empty, we get a forbidden. And if we change it to an array, then we get a message saying incorrect token array. So we're supposed to infer from this that an empty token is forbidden because the developers have put in some kind of protection to make sure we can't submit an empty token. But potentially they've forgotten about the array option because we get the incorrect token array here. So maybe we can use that null exploit with an uninitialized array to confirm this token. So let's move on to our benchmarking stage. So my instincts here would be that we need to create a new account and we're going to need to have a new email address for that. Sorry, a new username for that. I'll change this to cat1. And then as soon as we've registered it, we want to try and very quickly go and see if we can verify the token and have it set to this empty array. So I'm going to create a new group and I'll add both of these tabs to the group. I'll call it race and change the color. And then we can go to the single packet attack and we'll click send. The first one comes back and says, please check your emails for the account registration link. And the second one comes back again, incorrect token. Okay, so if we have a look at the bottom right here, we can see that the first response came back in 194 milliseconds and the second one in 82. So if we checked the token before actually registering the account, that's obviously not gonna be valid at that stage. Perhaps we can just put in a lot more of these token verifications. Let me try and do like 20, something like we normally do. And then I'll just go back to the very first one. Let's change this to cat2 and we'll send it in parallel. And then we can just go and have a look through these and see is there actually any difference in the responses. You can see in the bottom right, there is some variation in the timing. So maybe we would just get one that aligns. And I think I did actually get this working on a fluke at one stage, but it's not a very reliable way. So the other thing that we could potentially do is that connection warming thing. And I did also try to do this. We can go and grab like a get request. We'll send that to the repeater as well. And then just put that into our group. And let me change this to cat3. This was from another one of the labs that we used where we sent a get request first. So that comes back in 128 milliseconds. And then the second registration request comes back in 228. And then we've got 78, we've got 128. So yeah, these are all coming back too quickly. So we need to rethink our approach. So let's move over to Turbo Intruder. And we've done a couple of scripts with this so far already. We've got this registration request and I'm gonna highlight the username. I'm gonna right click, go to extension, send it to the, um, I'm not seeing it. Okay, I think I need to re-enable it for some reason. Let me disable it and load it again. This happens to me quite a lot, so if it also happens to you, maybe you can let me know why. And now if we go back to extensions, we now have Turbo Intruder. We'll send it to the Turbo Intruder. And then we get up this template. It's currently at the last one used. I'm gonna change that to the single packet attack. And this is just Python code. If we go up to our request up here, we can see this is where the placeholder is for our username. So each time we're gonna insert a username here into this request. And our idea here is essentially, we want to send multiple registration requests, each one with a different username. And then for each username we register, we want to try and do multiple token verification requests. So firstly, we need a unique username. So let us go ahead and say our username is equal to, and then I've already used cat, so let's use something else. I'm gonna say dog. And then we'll add on 
the loop index. So this is i, so we're just saying here it's going to be dog one, and the second one's going to be dog two until we get through all 20 of them. And then the gate that we send here is also going to be the same. So I'm going to do string and then i, and this will be the first gate, and then on the second loop, we'll do the second gate, etc. We also need to send the username, of course, in this request. That's where we have that percentage s to fill in. And then once that has been queued, we should be able to just try and loop through. And you might need to play around with the values here. I had some more luck with some of the values which weren't specified in the official solution, but I'll go with the official one for now. Let's do 50. And we're going to say then we want to do 50 requests to that token page. So you can go and grab this here. We don't need all of these headers. You could just take a copy of this and use this. That's also fine. But you don't actually need all of these headers. There is an extension, I forget what it's called for Burp, which will essentially try and find out which headers aren't required for functionality. So you could give it a request like this and then run the extension and it would basically try send in many requests, each one with some headers missing and see does it get back the same response each time. And if it doesn't get back the same response, it'll add the header back. So it basically means that it'll just remove any headers which don't affect the functionality of the site. Um, so you, you don't need all this. I think all you need is like the host, the cookie, and the content length, but and obviously like the post confirm. But I'll just take a copy of it for now. Let's go up here and add this request. So this is our token request. Token request is equal to. And then, yeah, you can just paste this in, or you can go and start taking some of this stuff out. Let's take this out. Let's take all of that out. I think that's fine. I think you also need this new line here. So a lot of things can go wrong here if you have like wrong indentation or white space or some headers that are incorrect or missing, then you could have some issues. But this should be okay for us. So we're going to say for this one, then we want to do the same thing as above. We're going to do engine.q and then we're going to pass in the token request and the gate. So the gate is going to be the same. So yeah, we're queuing in the same gate. We're queuing first our registration request and then 50 token verification requests. And that's it. We should just be able to then open the gate and hopefully it will work. Well, that's good. Let's get rid of this. I forgot we had that there still. So it's going to loop through 20 times. And then for each of those 20 registrations, it's going to do 50 requests. And then it's going to add all of these to response table. You can also go and update these. So previously I used this to say we only want to match the 200 responses and we're only interested in ones that come back with a successful message. But just for debugging, for visualization, let's just do it as is for now. So I think that's everything. Let's go to attack. Okay, that's not everything. I don't see any of our registration requests. Let's cancel that. Okay, I see that I have used the same loop index twice. So let's change the second one to a J and we'll go to attack and we'll filter by status. We're interested in the 200s and we're interested in any variation in the length of these. You can see that all the registrations are coming back 200 okay, but then notice what we have here. We've got some that don't have any username and the length is different. So if we go and have a look at those and have a look at the response, we'll see that it says account registration for user dog nine is successful. And this means we can basically just go and try and log in with that user account and whatever password we set to find that out. We can go and have a look at the request and the password was cat. So that's it. We can log in with dog nine and cat. One thing I'll mention here while we're still doing this, let me run this again. I'm going to change the username now. Let's change it to frog. And then I'm going to run the same thing again. I got stuck here for a long time where I just wasn't getting the result we wanted. I was getting all these 200 OKs for the registration, but I wasn't getting any of the token verifications correctly. And it took me a while to realize that if you actually have a look at the responses here, it says an account already exists with this email. So what happened to me is I had correctly verified the token, but I'd missed the fact that that happened. So then every time I ran the script afterwards, it was using this same email address. And because that email address is now officially registered to an account, it needs to be changed to something else for this to work. So I got stuck on that for a while. You can actually set this up to use multiple parameters. So maybe if you need a unique email, you could do something similar to this percentage S and have it so that it takes the same username as the email each time as well. Just something worth bearing in mind. Let us go and try and log in with the account. It looks like we don't need this email server at all, by the way. I don't see 
any reason for it. So I'm going to go to account, I'm going to go to dog9, and then cat. We log in, and of course, we can go to the admin panel and delete the user Carlos. Anyway, that has been the Partial Constructions Race Conditions Lab. I think this was a pretty cool one. I hope they will add some more race condition labs in the future as well. And in the next video, we'll be looking at time sensitive attacks and also how we can prevent race conditions. As usual, let me just recommend that you sign up to the Integrity platform if you want to try and find some race condition vulnerabilities and get paid for it. This is a good place to start. And I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have any questions or comments, leave them down below. Thanks.